Terraria is a great example of a game that nails almost every feature it contains, and I absolutely love it. It's an exploration-focused, combat-heavy game with intriguing NPCs and wonderful mechanics. Additionally, it's developed by a small, extremely passionate team. It's just a good game. I first got it on the PS3 back in 2013 and on Steam a couple years later. Playing it again for the footage of this video has been a blast. It's got a fair share of problems, but there's a reason it has sold over 40 million copies. Minecraft is a very similar game that attempts to do a lot of the same things that Terraria does, just executed much worse. Minecraft is a good game, but I feel that most criticisms can be captured under the overwhelming fact that it struggles with one key feature that Terraria excels at. Progression. Progression is key in any open world survival game. You could argue that Minecraft is meant to be more of a building game or a platform with which players can make their own experiences, and I'd say you're correct. But that's not what this video is about. I think critiquing Minecraft's progression is perfectly relevant because survival single player is the base from which it developed. It's silly to ignore the base survival game as if it's not an integral part of the Minecraft experience. If you're afraid of hearing critical opinions about a game you love, then perhaps this video is not for you. Just know this video was made out of a place of love for Minecraft. I know I've started from a very critical perspective, but let me be clear. In some ways, Minecraft is really good. The concept of mining is simple and intuitive. Anyone can left and right click. There's almost no skill to the action itself. Beyond that, getting the hang up building isn't all that hard either. Sure, you can take the time, become a master at building, but you certainly don't need to do that to progress in Minecraft. In the standard vanilla survival experience of Minecraft, there is a serious imbalance of challenges and rewards. Building things isn't too hard, so that's not a big deal. Mobs are pretty easy to fight, so, you know, that's fun. You could do anything you want while gathering up all the resources you need to build your mega base. Even better, you can become a redstone wizard and automate the hell out of your world, essentially letting the game do everything for you. You can beat the inner dragon with almost no effort, fight the wither with a little more effort maybe, uh, and get some elytra and some advancements, and that's really about it in terms of what the game lays out for you. This all sounds okay in theory. In fact, I'm willing to bet it works for some people. I'm sure tons of you feel that Minecraft has fulfilled what you wanted it to fulfill as a game. You may even argue that its simplicity is what made Minecraft successful. Anyone can play it. It doesn't need a lot of progression. But I ask you this. When was the last time you sat down and played a single player vanilla Minecraft world with no ulterior motive? That is to say, without having some other reason outside of the game itself or because of new snapshots in content. It's been a long time, I'm willing to bet. And I don't mean, oh, I created a new world and played it for a couple hours and got bored and haven't touched it in weeks. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. I mean, the last time you sat down and took the time to just become immersed into the game for no reason other than to just do it. A game can be both simple to pick up and have meaningful progression. The ease in playing can come from how the game teaches the player. And there's a good reason you haven't picked up the game in a while. It's because the game's kind of boring. If you're like me, you've been playing Minecraft for a decade. If you're especially stupid like I am, you will have a career revolved around it and consequently spiral into a deep depression where the thing that brought you joy is not tied to making you money and you're afraid that you're gonna end up like every other boomer who hates the job. Unfortunately, Minecraft sucks at making players feel good while playing it. The vanilla survival experience in Minecraft is mind-numbingly boring and hasn't changed in any significant way since 2011. All the time, I see people commenting things like, this game is only fun with friends or mods. And while I disagree with them in some ways, it's very easy to understand why many people feel this way. We've grown up. Minecraft hasn't. It's kind of like a, an old, reliable car. It always works, but you're not thrilled to drive it anymore. When you're at home and you want something to do, it'll work, but it doesn't go 0 to 60 like the new cars can. Even still, it's Always there waiting for you to open the garage. Always an option when you need to take a nice evening and a relaxing drive. I believe that the reason Minecraft feels so boring to many players is because it lacks any real sense of progression. As I said previously, progression is one of the most important factors of any video game. Progression can come in many forms. In some games like Mario, it's in your ability to take on more and more difficult parkour challenges as the game goes on. Utilizing the knowledge and skills that you've gained from earlier on to take on the challenges in the end game is a very rewarding and engaging experience. Another great example is Metroid. Metroid games are like the pinnacle of progression. Players start off extremely weak and fragile, only to build up to extreme strengths through exploration and challenges. Other open world games like Terraria offer a more meaningful progression than Minecraft does. In fact, 
let's talk a little more about Terraria. Part 1. Terraria. In Terraria, players start with extremely lousy tools. These tools are not only agonizingly slow when it comes to gathering materials, but also have minus one range compared to any other standard tool. This is particularly engaging for a couple of reasons. One, starting with slow tools means that players have a need to obtain faster ones that can mine more. Two, having better tools incentivizes players to explore more things with those tools. Tools never break in Terraria. Instead, Terraria intentionally makes the early game feel slow, sluggish, and awful. For example, when using copper tools, players may find they mine materials like gold or platinum extremely slowly, but when they upgrade to iron tools, mining gold becomes just a little bit quicker, and so does mining everything else. While mining, they may come across a strange purple or red if you're weird, or that they can't seem to break. Luckily, coming back later with a new gold or platinum pickaxe allows them to mine it, as well as break other blocks much faster. You may expect players to be stoked about getting their hands on this new sweet ore, but by this point in the game, players likely already know what it is, and that's because of one horrible, massive eyeball. Part 1.1 Terraria Boss Fights The first boss in Terraria is King Slime, but nobody gives a shit about him, so let's move on. The second boss in Terraria is the Eye of Cthulhu, a massive eyeball that floats in the air and summons other little eyeballs to attack the player and then later grows teeth in the second phase of the fight. Players can summon this boss in one of two ways. The first way to summon it is by smashing six demon contact lenses together, but that's boring, so who cares? The second way is likely how many new players first discover that their life was about to become really, really bad. You see, when a player has silver armor or tungsten or higher, there is a chance that when night falls, they will get a very strange message popping up in the corner of their screen. To a new player, nighttime is already extremely dangerous. Early on, players have likely died several times to zombies and demonized already. To be told very ominously, you feel an evil presence watching you. As soon as night falls is terrifying and certainly made a 13-year-old me panic. The Eye of Cthulhu fight is both genius and perfectly executed. It's a real challenge for new players and certainly necessary to progress the game and build up your character past gold or platinum tools. Most players will die fighting the Eye on their first couple of attempts. If they're crafty enough, they may already have a decent bow ready for the fight. Bow's arrows are slow, but pack a decent punch against the boss, especially if they're lit on fire. Some may get lucky enough to even make it to the second stage, the stage where it grows teeth, but they are even more likely to die due to the boss's increased speed. The reward for this fight is a bunch of that fancy purple or red stuff that the players came across earlier, except now they can craft a couple things with it. Players can make a really powerful new sword or even a new powerful bow, but it feels like there's supposed to be more to it. If you're a very astute player, you may have noticed that this new ore is reminiscent of that creepy biome you died in several times on your way to the ocean. It's called the corruption. You might want to pay attention to it. Your little guide friend told you to make some weird worm bait using a demon altar, whatever that is. Uh, but hey, he hasn't steered you wrong this far, so you know, what's the big... What is that? It's a strange floating orb. Well, 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 don't mind if I do- Oh, I got a fucking gun! Guns radically change how players have been dealing with range attacks up to this point. Arrows from bows shoot extremely slow and can be difficult to aim. Guns fix this problem. Bullets shoot much faster and pack a decent punch. The only issue is, the gun you got is extremely slow at firing, much slower than that bow you've been using. So naturally, you buy a slightly weaker gun that shoots faster from the merchant, and you're off blasting that worm thing the guy told you about. This is a really good example of effective progression. The player learns key information about where to go next via the game itself and organically discovers new things that radically change how they approach the combat at each point. The gun versus bow predicament is just one example of how combat evolves as you continue to play, but that's not even the best part. You don't have to kill the Eye of Cthulhu to get the gun. That's just how most people do it. In the footage you're watching, I got the gun first, and an extremely powerful melee weapon, and I use them both to just fly through these boss fights. If a player has extensive knowledge of the game's mechanics, then they could take on the challenge of entering the corruption before ever having good gear and getting their hands on much more powerful items before most other players would, allowing them to breeze through some of these boss fights as a reward for their knowledge of the game. The Underground Corruption is extremely dangerous early game. To have the ability to overcome that difficulty and be rewarded with some really powerful tools in the process is amazing progression. This progression extends beyond just combat though. Players can find small pieces of gear that allow them to jump higher, jump twice, run faster, swim faster, be immune to lava. There's all kinds of pieces of gear that you can find. 
Terraria keeps things fair by limiting the amount of gear you can use at any given time, and due to limited inventory space, it's very unlikely that players will keep tons of gear on them to swap in and out, forcing them to think carefully about what armor, weapons, and gear they choose to wear when they are out and about. After you get done destroying that little worm guy, you realize it's been dropping scales this entire time. Using these scales and that fancy ore you found, you can now craft all new armors and tools. With this new gear, you can finally start mining your way through the corruption biome. Eventually, you talk to some old dude at a big dungeon, then he just explodes into a floating skull with arms. You know, no big deal, just like any other Tuesday. So you take him down, then suddenly, the progression splits in a very meaningful way. You can choose one of four paths relating to combat. Melee, ranged, magic, or summoner. You can craft molten armor for melee, bone armor for range, jungle armor for magic, and to be honest, I don't, what, what do summoners do? What do they do? Hold on. They get, they get obsidian armor? It, it, bee armor? What, what are these people doing? Okay, I lied. So technically, progression splits much earlier than this, but I think this is probably just the best point for most people uh, to figure out what class they're going to be dedicating their time to, because they're going to be dedicating a lot of time to it. By this point in the game, players may begin to feel that they can reasonably take on most challenges in the world. They've got the best armor, the best tools, they can take down most enemies they come across pretty quickly, and they may even have the best sword in the game, the Knight's Edge. The game then challenges you to go to the depths of hell and defeat a massive flesh monster. Upon completion, you officially beat the game, roll the credits, except that's not what happens at all. Everything you thought you knew about the game gets thrown out, and you die super easily again, and everything is awful now. There are these wraith enemies that can travel through walls, and corruption is spreading faster than ever, the hollow biome is beautifully and terrifyingly dangerous, the jungle just got marked. Where's Who are these people? Are, are those pirates? Part 1.2. Oh fuck, you're weak again. After defeating the Wall of Flesh in Terraria, you officially enter Hard Mode, which is just a fancy way of the devs telling you that the game just started and you've now exited the tutorial phase. The devs essentially say, we hope you enjoyed feeling like you were on top of the world for a while, because now things are much worse. When you kill the Wall of Flesh, it always drops the Pawn Hammer. The Pawn Hammer can destroy Demon Altars, you know those things that we used earlier to get the Worm Bait? It's within this feature that Terraria mixes a progression once again and causes you to rethink how you've been mining. Upon breaking a demon altar, and getting to one is no simple task in this new hard mode, players will be rewarded with the addition of six, technically three, ores added to their world. These ores serve as replacements for the previous three ores that you were mining, technically six. Look, there's a lot about ores, I don't want to go into it, whatever, you get the point. Each set of tools can only mine the next ore up, forcing players to progress linearly from one ore to the next to the next. From here, the game's progression expands tenfold. There are many different pieces of gear that you can make and many different enemies to take on that net different rewards. You have to choose what rewards benefit your playstyle the most. There's a lot of really interesting progression features within Terraria. NPCs that come and go and different benefits to moving them in with other NPCs and all the gadgets that you can craft by combining them with other gadgets and just so much more. But I think you get my point here. Terraria handles progression perfectly. In the beginning, it lets you feel weak, slowly allowing you to build up your power and feel like you're on top of the world, only to pull the rug out from under you and cause you to fall right back down in the bottom of an even harsher, less forgiving world, in which you must build yourself up once again. It goes much further beyond what I've talked about here. The game keeps going until you are literally wearing futuristic space armor and have a sword made up of every other important sword in the game. It's, it's good stuff. It's an immersive open world that challenges and rewards players, allowing us to feel like we've conquered it all. The only thing that I can really knock Terraria for is that it's linear. It's not open-ended. Minecraft is open-ended, but it does progression infinitely worse. Part 2. Minecraft kinda sucks. In Minecraft, you start with nothing. Unless you're cool and enable the bonus chest, that is. It's not cheating, it's a feature, Emily. It's a feature! They put it in the- it's a feature, I, I don't know- From there, you can craft wooden tools, which you need to get stone tools, which you need to get iron tools, which you need to get diamond tools, which you need to get netherite, and that's it. You've just got the best stuff in the game already, huh? It's been a couple of hours? Minecraft's progression is just mining and crafting, which is good in some ways. It's simple, intuitive, like I mentioned earlier. But the only real divergence from this formula came in 1.20 with the introduction of the upgrade template. Now hold on. It took them over 10 years and 20 major updates to finally change up the progression. It took Mojang this long to realize that limiting progression to just mining ores over and over gets old, 
What the actual fuck? The upgrade template itself is fairly rare and is only found in bastions and extremely deadly fortresses in the depths of the nether. Using a template on gear causes the template to disappear. Luckily, you can duplicate these, but the cost is seven diamonds, which can be fairly steep. But what price would you pay for the best gear in the game? The big issue with Minecraft's progression is that none of it is really challenging or engaging. I'm not saying I want Minecraft to emulate what Terraria does. I like Minecraft. Its core mechanics are simple. You mine, you get stuff, you use that stuff to get more stuff, and you use that new stuff to get even more stuff. It's very simple to understand. This by itself isn't necessarily bad, but Minecraft's progression has another big issue. You can get the third best tier of tools within 60 seconds of making a brand new world. And everyone is just weirdly okay with this? Like imagine you're playtesting any game and the devs tell you, yeah, you can get the third best gear within almost like a minute of starting the game, allowing you the ability to earn the second or the first within an hour or two if you're lucky enough or skilled enough. That sounds pretty cool on paper, but when you realize that there's not that much depth to getting the second, and maybe the first is a little more depth, it's incredibly boring. A, a good philosophy to have when designing a game, and I'm not a dev, so I'm completely talking out of my ass here, uh, is that when you have challenges, they need to net good rewards. So the more challenging an obstacle is, the more good the reward needs to be. Getting the best gear in the game should be difficult, but rewarding either difficult in that you put tons of time into it, or difficult that you overcame a great challenge. My issue here isn't that iron is easy to obtain, it's that iron is the third best tool in the game, and going from iron to diamond is extremely easy. It only gets a little harder when going from diamond to netherite, which I appreciate. I love how netherite is implemented into the game. Requiring players have diamond tools already, and gold ingots to get netherite is a really cool feature. It's a meaningful and important change of pace when it comes to getting gear. On paper, the ability to get the best gear from the start seems like a really cool mechanic, and it's certainly rewarding for players who deeply understand the game's mechanics. The issue with the system is that you don't have much in the way of engaging progression after you get the best gear. Maybe, you know, have a beacon if you want to do that, but what good is that when you've conquered everything else already? But Garrett, I see you typing in the comments. What about enchanting? It's a lot of fun and adds a whole new layer of depth to the game. No, enchanting was ruined with 1.14 and has not recovered since. Players can now set up makeshift borderline slavery-based breeding camps to get all the enchantments they need and basically continually murder innocent villagers over and over and bring them back to life to get the best prices for those enchantments. Mojang didn't want to add fireflies to Minecraft because they're so toxic to some species of frogs, but Mojang is totally fine and accepting of players setting up slavery breeding factories so some books can cost a lot less, so that the players can be the god of this world. It's insane and it makes zero sense. I've made an entire video about why mending and other enchantments are kind of broken in Minecraft. Essentially, Mojang killed any real enchanting progression with the 1.14 update. Players start in the world, find the nearest village, which is extremely easy to do now, and set up their little breeder stations, get all the enchantments they need within a couple of hours. There is nothing fun about breaking lecterns over and over until you get mending. This is not engaging. This is not a meaningful form of progression. Thankfully, Mojang is testing ways of fixing this issue by limiting what enchantments villagers can have and making them biome dependent. Mending books can now only be traded from swamp villagers. This is amazing. What a, what a great system because there are no villages in swamps. Players either have to transport two villagers from the breeding camps, which can be a, a nightmare to do, or wait around a swamp at night praying that two zombie villagers spawn. It's not a perfect solution. I understand that many people would get annoyed with having to transport the villagers or wait around for a zombie, but this is a step in the right direction. Let me ask you this. When you're done setting up your little glorified forced labor camp in Minecraft, do you feel, do you feel good about yourself? Are you proud of the work you just put in? Did that feel like honest work required for the best enchantments in the game? The answer is no. At least I don't feel good about it. It's not engaging in the slightest. How the hell is breaking lecterns over and over fun? It's horrible. So you just log off and you shit on the game in the nearest YouTube comment section when somebody says the game is still fun. 
Occasionally, I do find single-player vanilla Minecraft to be a peaceful and calm experience. However, I notice that I only play single-player when there's new content to look at because, dear God, anything new is a breath of fresh air. Recently, Mojang has been taking steps to make already existing structures have more function in new exclusive loot, as well as creating new structures like Trial Chambers and Trail Ruins to encourage players to go exploring again. Trial Chambers are super cool, and I think they are a great addition to the game. However, the content added to existing structures in 1.20 leaves a lot to be desired. That being said, armor trims are really cool. I love the customization. I think it's one of the best moves Mojang has pulled in a long time. On a personal note, using armor trims and NBT data, you can basically create custom armors with their own textures and stats. For example, I made like an amethyst armor set that gives you like a 10% speed boost when you're wearing the full set. It's just iron, but it has the same defense as chainmail. Just noting that there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with commands. So anyway, uh, Armor trims are cool and all, but none of them actually progress your character in any meaningful way. Rather than give these structures unique loot that change up how you engage with the world somehow, Mojang opted to have them give some cosmetic stuff as to not interrupt the currently bad progression of the game. To illustrate my point, let's compare some loot you get from a desert pyramid in Minecraft to some of the loot you get from a desert pyramid in Terraria. Yes, we're using Terraria again. I'm sorry. It's just a really good example. Forgive me. Pyramids in Minecraft have their own basic loot table that yield kind of junk like rotten flesh and bones, or the occasional emerald, diamond, or even a golden apple. These are nice. They're incredibly useful. However, they've been this way in the game for over 10 years. In 1.20, Mojang essentially added a new room to Pyramids with the addition of Archaeology, a genuinely cool feature by the way, and you can also find the Dune Armor Trim. Beyond this purely cosmetic armor trim, there is nothing exclusive to the structure. Well, I guess there's the uh, the certain pottery shards, but that's not the point. There is nothing exclusive to this sh structure progress-wise. This feels like a good time to explain the different types of progress that you can have in video games. There is vertical progress and horizontal progress. Vertical progress is pretty simple. You can go from A to B to C and so on. Horizontal progress makes things a lot more interesting. Instead of going from A to B, you may go from a to A1, or maybe switch things up and go back to B, or B1. Sometimes horizontal progression can just be a one-off thing. Maybe it goes to A3, and A3 doesn't go to a B3, it just stops there. I couldn't tell you who I got this from, but I know I've heard people talk about the different types of progression in video games, and why they differ, and why that's important. It's something to keep in mind when I talk about progression. Anyway, in Terraria, you can get a unique vanity set of Pharaoh's clothes. Cool, pretty similar to Minecraft in that respect. You can also get two really useful items for early game the magic carpet, and the sandstorm in a bottle. The magic carpet is kind of ass, but it allows players to hover in midair for a short time. Kind of neat, you know, just allows for some horizontal jumps. Pretty nice. This makes previously difficult jumps a lot easier. The sandstorm in a bottle is one variant of similar items that allow the player to double jump. It has its own animation that is unique from other double jumping items, like the cloud in the bottle or the fart in the jar. Okay, listen, I unironically use the fart in the jar because it's just a, it, the fart noise makes me giggle, okay? I'm a cavalcade of childlike cynicism, unleashing my dreams of comedy onto the world, and in this endless pursuit, I have no bounds. <laughs> in other words, I'm 12. The coolest part about the sandstorm in a bottle isn't how it allows players to jump further, but how it can be used to craft better items. For example, you can combine it with a red balloon, an item that increases the normal jump height, to make a sandstorm in a balloon. You could then take that balloon and tie a horseshoe to it to have a single item that lets you jump higher, double jump, and negate all fall damage all in one. This is crafting with depth. It's intuitive, engaging, creative, and rewards players for exploration with more than just pretty clothing. It doesn't just give players something to say, hey, cool item I can use once, but rather opens the door for even more possibilities in terms of crafting that you may have not been aware of, all from one structure. Every structure in Terraria houses some kind of loot that players can utilize to further progress their abilities, and almost every single one can be used to craft something new. Everything has a purpose. By contrast, in Minecraft, half the random things I grab from structures are either the exact same or serve to little to no purpose. My point is, Minecraft seriously lacks any real engaging progression, and as such, it's extremely boring to get the best gear in the game. I'm tired of using Terraria as a reference, and because I don't want to get more footage of this game than I have to, let's look at Zelda Breath of the Wild. In this game, much like Minecraft, you can go anywhere and do anything at any time. Similarly, it's possible to get the best gear in the game as soon as the world opens up to you. Theoretically, you could head straight to Hyrule Castle where the hardest enemies are, though the path to get there is covered with guardians that can kill you in one shot from dozens of feet away. So getting to Hyrule Castle is difficult at the start of the game, 
but if you're sneaky enough and knowledgeable of the area, you can do it while picking up some really, really good weapons along the way. You can then use these weapons to take down a boss within the castle, which gives you the best shield in the game. Frankly, if you can do it, you've earned it. You spend hours dying and sneaking your way past the toughest enemies to get every sword and arrow you could off them to defeat a pretty powerful boss. You've earned this. With this new shield and other gear you've picked up, you can get a head start on some of the shrines or dungeons that you may go through, or you can go fight Ganon if you really want to. This is both very challenging and very rewarding. Nintendo did kind of ruin this with the DLC. You could just use Majora's Mask and ruin the experience for yourself by just trivializing all of the stuff I just mentioned, but hey, still cool that if you choose not to be a wuss. Let's ask ourselves a question. Does Minecraft do anything similar to this? For most of the game, no. In fact, as I previously mentioned with mending, it's criminally easy to get the best enchantments up for your gear. The only time a challenge is involved is when players set their sights on netherite, but because of how easy players can get the second best tools or even the best armor in the game, it becomes boring and there are no challenges for you to overcome after you do the two bosses. This is where dungeons and trial chambers could save the game, but so far, failed to do so for a multitude of reasons. Part three, dungeons suck. In release 1.0, Minecraft saw its first real dungeons added to the game, the Stronghold and the Nether Fortress. Both act as crucial points in the game's progression. This was back in the day when progression was fairly simple and we didn't have to enslave innocent villagers to get mending, probably because many didn't exist. These dungeons at the time were considered amazing and innovative additions to the game. Dungeons up to that point had just been small rooms with the exclusive mossy cobblestone block, a couple chests, and a monster spawner which spawned one of three mobs, spiders, zombies, or skeletons. Side note, uh, here's something you may not know. You could fully customize how these spawners work with commands. Like, Mojang has a plethora of tools that they have graciously allowed us to use and to tinker with. It's such a shame that they themselves do not take advantage of these tools literally built into the game. By editing the NBT data of a spawner, I can change how many mobs it can spawn at once, how close a player needs for it to activate, how far away from the spawner mobs can spawn, what the mobs are wearing, what tools they are carrying, their health, status effects, names, their loot tables, and so much more. Using all these tools, I'm able to create unique challenges. Uh, for example, on my server, I make my own dungeons uh, by utilizing the yeah. Fuck. By changing the MBT data of spawners, I have made custom enemies that my players can take on. We have everything from poison skeletons to boss fights that range from, oh, this isn't too bad, to, holy shit, why does it run that fast? In my dungeons, boss mobs typically have armor that makes them faster than the average mob. For example, the Dungeon Guardian 1 is a pretty basic boss mob. It moves 20% faster than the normal zombies do. And the Guardian 4 moves 80% faster, which is just about the same as a player's sprint speed. In addition to the movement buffs, their armor and weapons typically have enchantments that make fighting them particularly painful. The Guardians 3 and 4 have thorns on their armor and high protection on the armor as well, and just increased health. For an added challenge, I tend to put skeletons or witches posted up top of the boss rooms to shoot at players while they frantically try to outrun the main boss mob. It took a lot of trial and error, but the only way I've been able to accomplish this is by using plugins and commands to severely limit what my players can do while in boss rooms. To enter a boss room, players must click a sign that teleports them in. They can see into the boss room, but barrier blocks prevent them from shooting in. Once inside, they cannot break or place blocks, or place boats, or use ender pearls. If they try to quickly run to the treasure, they'll find that it's set up as a parkour route that can only be activated via a button with a slight delay, making it very hard for players to jump to safety without being killed. Likewise, if players attempt to leave, there is a door out, but usually there is a massive delay between when you push the button and when the door actually opens. I've also started using cobwebs and 1.5 block tall gaps to achieve the same effect. Players are forced to engage with the boss to get loot, lest they wish to die. There's no cheesing these dungeons. These mechanical challenges accomplish a couple things, incentivizing teamwork and genuine engagement with the boss fights. It only takes this much work because Minecraft's AI is so awful and it makes creating any challenge extremely difficult. The tools that Mojang have given us are effectively offset by how crap the AI is. If I had tried to make this work without the use of plugins, I couldn't. Every single mob can be placed into a boat and made effectively worthless. I've witnessed it happen. Players would rush into a boss room, trap the boss in a boat, and kill it with zero challenge or effort. This abuse of the game's mechanics is the death of any vanilla challenge. Couple this with the lack of real challenges to begin with, and you really begin to see why so many people are bored of the game. 
It's easy to see why mod packs like RL Craft are so popular. They make progression meaningful, and there's a real challenge. Mojang's lackluster use of their own features and poor hostile mob AI create the perfect storm for a very boring and repetitive experience. Actually, I think we should talk a little bit more about AI for a minute. There's a lot that goes into this, and there's a lot that could be fixed. Part four, bad AI. If a skeleton shoots another mob, so long as that mob has not already been hit by the player, that mob will turn to attack the skeleton 100% of the time. This is cool in theory and even makes for some neat situations where you can save yourself by getting a skeleton to shoot a creeper and blow up all the mobs around you. But if you say enter a trial chamber and you find yourself in a room with a ton of skeleton spawners, they will all shoot each other to death before you get a chance to lay a hand on them. Again, this will happen 100% of the time so long as you don't attack any other mobs first. You can let them do all the hard work for you, regardless of what difficulty you are on. The thing is, Mojang already has mobs that ignore this rule. Pillagers and piglings can shoot each other all day and not care. They'll still kill you even with an arrow in their head. They don't care. You're the target. This is one of the reasons that illagers and piglings are some of the most toughest enemies in the game. They're the only enemies that begin to pose a real threat to players, and as such create some of the only actual challenges players will face. For example, inside of woodland mansions or during village raids, an evoker can spawn. The evoker is a mini boss fight that is genuinely hard to beat if you don't have the proper gear or a good sense of what you need to do. This is an example of a pretty good boss fight. It uses a variety of attacks, and when you find one, it's never alone. It almost always has other illagers around it to make the fight that much more difficult. And as a reward for taking one on, you get a totem of undying, an item that literally lets you cheat death. A worthy reward, for sure. This is one of those meaningful progression items that Minecraft is severely lacking. Illagers are probably one of the best examples of progression and challenge that Minecraft has to offer. You would think that maybe the final boss would be more challenging, but you can literally kill it in seconds with beds. So what can Mojang do to fix this? Part 5. How can Mojang fix this? Going back to monster spawners for a moment, these blocks have the potential to do amazing things. And as it stands, the biggest issue with them is how players exploit them and turn them into automatic mob grinders. Actually, hold on a minute. I haven't... Oh my god, I haven't talked about automation yet! Holy shit! The real part five. Automation kills the game. We'll get back to actually fixing it later, sorry. Before we talk about solutions, I think it's important to talk about automation and its role in severely harming the game's progression. Like most things in Minecraft, the idea of having multiple farms that can do all the heavy lifting for you sounds really cool. In order to make some of these farms, it takes a lot of work to design one and understand redstone. In many cases, you have to have a deep understanding of how the game works to create some of these farms. But that's just it. You're not the one designing it, are you? Most of you didn't take the time to learn how to conceptualize and execute such an intricate farm that utilizes iron golem spawning to yield tons of iron. You watched Mumbo Jumbo or someone else do it and then told your friends about your new talent. You let another player do all the hard work of designing the machine. You simply pointed and clicked where they told you to. You don't have to understand automation or learn basic electronic circuits. Hell, you don't even need to know what redstone does. You just point and click wherever the funny YouTube man tells you to click. Actually taking the time to learn redstone and applying it is super cool. It's really engaging. I recently learned what comparators can do, and I've started using them to design my own things for my server. I deeply respect those YouTubers who help people understand redstone. It's a really useful tool, and education is never a bad thing. I just think some people may abuse that for education as an excuse to never truly learn or understand how things work. The worst part is, it's not really the player's fault. This is just how the game is made. Minecraft does nothing to teach players of how redstone works. Or, c correction, it has almost zero examples of how redstone functions. The only two examples I can think of are ancient cities and jungle temples. And these either have very limited uses, or are locked behind one of the most deadliest challenges in the game, and not to mention tons of cool loot, meaning likely nobody will ever take the time to look at the redstone. They'll just get the things that they want to loot, and then leave like every other structure in the game. You are essentially forced to go onto the internet and learn from others, which isn't bad on its own. It can you know, be a good community thing. It becomes a problem when players have no reason to learn themselves and are content with just watching someone else do all the hard work and then reaping the rewards. This isn't the fault of the player or the content creator, it's the fault of the game. I'm sure we all at least know one person who plays Minecraft, gets all these automatic farms going, and then goes, well, why is the game so boring? You are making it boring. 
you don't take the time to design these things yourself, you've copied someone else's work, and frankly, the game does a terrible job of teaching you these mechanics, so I can't blame you. However, some automatic farms were clearly not anticipated by the developers. Do you really think Mojang accounted for people to set up massive gold farms on the roof of the nether? Do you think they felt that people would breed villagers endlessly to satiate their capitalist desires, to control their own little wage slaves, only to have them killed and brought back to life in order to obtain a cheaper price? No. They didn't. That's why they patched the one out after four years of being in the game. They didn't think we'd be monstrous enough to do that. But hey, they designed the villager system to be that shitty and promote that kind of behavior, so can you blame a guy for trying? On the bright side, they have fixed the villager thing, for the most part. Mojang's blatant disregard for their own mechanics and how players abuse them actually causes a net decrease in freedom and variety. The consequence of how the game is designed unintentionally pushes players down a very narrow path to achieve efficiency. But Garrett, I hear you typing in the comments, you don't have to set up these farms, you could choose not to. Sure, this is true. However, in any competitive vanilla multiplayer experience, you kinda do. Even in non-competitive servers, players still feed into this weird desire to outdo their fellow man. They have to have the best gear, the best loot, the most money, but then they rush and make all these automatic farms and then they go, oh, oh fuck, I'm bored again. And what do you do when you've reached the top? You get bored and you quit. Choosing to not make automatic farms and do things the hard way can also lead some players to make fun of other players for not doing things the most efficient way. For a game that promotes freedom, it sure does everything in its power to limit players from deviating from a specific game progression path. Okay, so how do we actually fix all of this? Part 6. How can Mojang fix this? Trial spawners and trial chambers are the light in the darkness. They have the potential to be a sort of saving grace when it comes to progression. The trial keys are really interesting, and I hope they do more than just unlock some random room or a box. Mojang has a golden opportunity here to do something really unique with these structures and the mechanics. But will they? Maybe? They've already proven they are willing to take things a step further than usual by having skeletons hold poison arrows in their offhand. Something they've never done before. A skeleton holding a tipped arrow? That's some spicy content right there. Now do the same for the other mobs. In my opinion, as the difficulty goes up, so too should the difficulty of structures and mechanics. Sure, mobs may have a ch higher chance of spawning with armor and hard mode than when compared to normal or easy, but imagine if Mojang actually edited the specific NBT data of mobs depending on the difficulty. Give me some zombies that wear full iron with enchantments and run faster than other zombies. Give me spiders that are invisible with extra health. Give players a serious variety of challenges if they want to take on higher difficulties. For example, everyone loves the breeze because it does something unique. Give us some more unique mobs to go along with it as well. As I've mentioned, this is all stuff I do on my server now. The intensity of these challenge makes the rewards for completing them feel all that more satisfying. When players overcome being overrun by a dozen baby zombies with axes, they feel much better about getting the loot because they put the work in. One trick I've been fond of lately is using skeletons in conjunction with baby zombies. The baby zombies are really short, so the skeletons just kind of shoot right over them and get to the player. It's a wonderfully deadly combination. Moving on from spawners, Minecraft's difficulty needs to change overall. I think that as things get more difficult, the game should change in substantial ways. For example, I like the idea of hostile mobs attacking each other, however I think as you raise the difficulty, the odds of the mobs turning on each other should become lower and lower. Perhaps in easy mode it's 100% they'll always turn on each other, in normal it goes down to 50, and in hard or hardcore it goes down to 25. This would mean that players would actually have to engage with mobs instead of just letting them kill each other or run the risk of damaging their gear while they pray that the other mobs turn on each other. But hey, durability isn't really that bad because mending is super easy to get anyway. That's another thing. Mending is way too easy to, re to acquire. And as per the last few things, I don't want this to change for easier or normal mode. Repairing your tools is not a viable option due to the too expensive tag. Again, I've made an entire video about mending that you should watch, but to recap, mending is cheap and Mojang's solution with revamping villagers is pretty good, but maybe not good enough for those higher difficulties. On higher difficulties, maybe like just hardcore, mending flat out should only be found in end cities or randomly through the enchantment table. Not through fishing, not through villager trades, nothing like that. Mending is supposed to be an end game enchantment. Why are 12 year olds speedrunning able to get it within minutes? It's disappointingly poor game design that you can get it within the first hour of playing the game. It's very antithetical to what hardcore should be. But like I said, in easy mode, it should just stay the way that it is with the villager revamp that Mojang is doing. I think it's a good solution. 
Something else Mojin could do is have more unique gear that can be found in structures or in different biomes. If Minecraft had, say, a special type of sword that could only be found in strongholds, maybe a boat that moves faster than all the other boats inside of ocean monuments, or pieces of that boat found among shipwrecks, these would be really cool, unique items. Imagine a system where players go into a jungle temple, maybe if they revamp it a little bit, and find fragments of an old bow. By combining these fragments with string and fermented spider eyes, for example, you could craft the poison bow. A bow that converts normal arrows into poison tipped arrows, similar to how the wither skeletons with bows automatically shoot fire arrows. That's a fun fact if you didn't know that. This can be expanded to almost anything. Swords that have longer reach but slower swing, items that extend your build reach like the crab claw can be found in a unique location. Imagine if Minecraft had a shield that could be found in bastions that had a rounder shape to it, not like an actual circle, but had increased defense against melee attacks. Perhaps axes wouldn't stun it as long. There are tons of different ways Mojang could add unique and interesting gear, and these are just a couple ideas I've kind of come off the top of my head. All of this could only be craftable via resources obtained from variants of trial spawners. Imagine if bastions had their own trial spawner variant that spawned custom piglins or piglin brutes that dropped unique items the players could use to craft exclusive gear. You get the point. This makes it all renewable. Actually, let's take this a step further. Imagine if every structure had some form of a trial spawner with their own loot tables. This means that players could come back anytime on any server and be able to craft the cool new items. If every structure had a trial spawner or some variation of trial spawner, then we wouldn't have to worry about scarcity. That's the biggest problem with the upgrade templates right now. Once one player has collected a bunch of upgrade templates from nearby bastions, it's incredibly difficult for weaker players to find them later because they're all taken. Bastions need a trial spawners to get upgrade templates. There's so much potential here, and I fear that Mojang will not harness it. They've given themselves the best tool to fix Minecraft, and they likely won't even do it. Now, some of you may be worried that some of the ideas I've brought up don't feel like vanilla Minecraft. And to be honest, that's an entirely subjective criticism, and it has no real objective meaning. However, I will give you a real counter-argument, because that's a very common critique that one may bring up. And I will counter it by saying that Mojang has already made gear that is unique, and is made in unique ways. The Turtle Helmet and the Trident. Both of these items are obtained in entirely unique ways. As of now, the Trident is the only weapon that you cannot craft yourself. It has to be found on a drowned or fished up. This is genius. It's a unique weapon that feels really cool to get because you have to work for it by either taking the time to fish it up or fighting off a drown with one, which is very challenging. Turtle shells are made from scoot, which is obtained through breeding turtles. The helmet gives you water breathing effect for a brief period of time. This is a piece of armor that gives you a status effect. Why is there not more of this? This unique crafting recipe and unique function are amazing. Mojang should expand upon this and give us more unique gear. Imagine a helmet that you would craft in the nether that briefly gives you fire resistance when you fall into lava, maybe say 10 seconds. Or maybe a chest plate that has a chance to not consume arrows when using a bow but is really fragile against melee attacks. There's so many things they could do, but I digress for now. All of these additions could be combined with certain AI changes to create a more challenging and rewarding experience as you raise the difficulty in Minecraft, thus incredibly enhancing Minecraft's progression. By locking certain materials behind certain challenges or certain biomes or structures, Mojang could effectively make some automatic farms useless. Instead of dungeons being used primarily to make mob grinders, maybe they could be actual dungeons which utilize trial spawners with different loot tables to make unique, renewable items and gear. All in all, this goes back to something I said earlier in the video. Better items need to be locked behind more difficult challenges. And Mojang understands this perfectly. There's a reason the Elytra is at the very end of the game. Otherwise, you face a progression that is stunted from the start. When you have a game like Minecraft that is so large and with so many of its players have been playing for like a decade or close to it, it's never a bad idea to add more difficulty options and challenges and ways to engage with the world to keep those players around. Once you've become the biggest game of all time, a priority you should have is to keep the existing player base engaged while steadily gaining more. I fear that many Minecraft players left the game years ago and may never come back. Perhaps a more meaningful progression, fixing the exploits and boring game design like mob AI and villages, would be enough to bring people back for a more exciting, challenging world. I want to say that I love Minecraft, and I do have fun playing the game. I do like the direction Minecraft is headed with 1.21. 
I've just had a lot of thoughts brewing in my head about the game for a long time. This video was originally going to be about the lost potential of trial spawners and how Mojang isn't going far enough. Instead, I came up with several video ideas about the game and I just managed to fit them all into one. I hope that it's been fun to watch and hey, if it's on in the background, that's cool too. I've already put a ton of time into this video and just writing the script. Taking the time to gather all the footage is going to take a while and I can only imagine how hard editing is going to be. If anything, I hope at the very least you use this video not to hate on Minecraft or hate on me for my bad opinions, but as a launch pad for your own ideas on how the game could be improved or changed slightly. I love to see that kind of stuff in the comments, it's some of my favorite things. I've been playing the game for over a decade and I wouldn't make a video this detailed if I didn't love it. I know I'll get a couple hate comments saying things like, if you don't like the game, just go play something else. And to those people I say, congratulations on completely missing the point of the video. I didn't make this to bring Minecraft down. I did it because I love the game and I want to see it improve. Regardless of what Mojang does, I'll probably still play this game, as should you. We can advocate for improvements and criticize while still being huge fans. Criticism doesn't mean the game or Mojang themselves are deserving of hate. In fact, I think we criticize it because we like it. We want to see it do better. We want to see more of it. Good criticism comes from a place of love for something, not a place of hate. Keep that in mind before you go writing a hate comment. <laughs> who am I kidding? Anybody who wanted to write a hate comment has already written one by this point. I, I welcome rebuttals and critiques of my ideas. So long as you're not mean about it, I may even have my mind changed. I welcome open debate and it's one of my favorite things about my videos. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you really enjoyed it and want to see more, consider liking and subscribing. My videos will likely be in this longer format moving forward. I like longer content. It's what inspires me. So I wanted to make some of my own. If you're interested in joining my Minecraft server, there's a Discord link in the description below. I think it's a ton of fun. I mean, obviously I'm a little bit biased. It's extremely unforgiving and as such, very rewarding. Players are giving a very different experience on my server than what they would in a normal SMP or just normal Minecraft. I'm proud of my work. I developed it for over a year and I'd love it if more people were there to witness it. Anyway, that's all for today's video. If you want to become a member, that's always an option. You could have seen this video early if you were a cool member, but I do appreciate your support nonetheless. I'll see you guys all in the next video. Bye-bye.